Hey everyone, uh, it's so good to be here at PyCon Canada. My name is Nina and I'm currently a developer at Venmo. I work as a senior software engineer. I've been a developer for about 10 years now, uh, working in Python for four, and I'm here to talk to you today about crafting some elegant solutions for your everyday Python problems. Um, so who's this talk for? This is a bit of an intermediate level talk where I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour of some of my favorite Python features. It might be useful to you if you're coming to Python from another programming language. And if you want to learn about some fancy features, things like magic methods, iterators, decorators, context managers, most of the strategies here are present in core Python. If not Python 2, then in Python 3. And I'm gonna try to point out differences in behavior between Python 2 and 3 where it's relevant. I also wanna highlight some packages that I personally find useful that can take your Python to the next level. And if you get lost, don't worry. Um, I have links to my slides here. You can follow along. There's also some uh, additional reading in the slides. Now, what is elegant code? What kind of problems are we trying to solve here? When I started working as a developer, I started my career out in Java as an enterprise Java developer. And I worked with some popular libraries at the time that provided features like dependency injection, ORM capabilities, but it always kind of felt bolted on to the language. I had nightmares about things like abstract singleton proxy factory beans. <laughs> uh, for those of you who've worked in Java before, you're nodding. Uh, and when I discovered Python, it kind of really felt like a breath of fresh air. It has some cool, innovative features, and they don't feel bolted on at all. It feels like a natural progression of the language. Now, how do we make code elegant? We've all seen the Zen of Python that beautiful is better than ugly, explicit better than implicit, simple better than complex, and complex is better than complicated. Those are great ideas, but how can we actually accomplish that? By picking the right tool for the job. And I'm here to share with you some practical code that you can use to make your code simpler, more elegant, and more explicit today. But you have to remember that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So what's elegant for me and beautiful for me might not be elegant and beautiful for you. The first way that we can accomplish this is with magic methods. Uh, and there's a little bit of terminology here that I want to talk about before we dive in. Um, some of you might have heard the term dunder. You've been like, what does that even mean? Um, it stands for double underscore. Uh, so like when you have two underscores before a method name. Now, you're used to implementing dunder stir, dunder wrapper, but there's really a whole world of other powerful magic methods that you can explore. Um, and by implementing a few of them, you can really take your objects to the next level and make them behave like built-ins such as numbers or lists, uh, dictionaries, and lots more. A little example of this, uh, here we have a straightforward currency class. And it knows about the conversion rate between two different currencies based on the dollar. Um, here we have a dollar and a euro, which is um, 85 or 88 cents of a dollar. And we also have a constructor that accepts a symbol and an amount. It also knows how to represent the currency using Dunder Repr. So here we go and print out the symbol. And lastly, it knows how to convert from one currency to another. So what can we do with this? That was pretty basic stuff. Uh, we can represent the cost of two meals in different currencies, uh, for example, a, a soda in dollars and a pizza in euros. And because we implemented wrapper, it looks like a nice printout. But let's implement another magic method. This one is called dunder add for addition. And if we wanted to, we could also do things like support subtraction, multiplication, and other mathematical operations. So let's see why this is so powerful. This is going to allow us to use this currency class in a really intuitive way. It's currency. You kind of expect to be able to perform operations on it. Here we can add the cost of a soda and a pizza together, uh, independent of what currency they're uh, represented in. Uh, so these methods are currency aware, which is really cool. 
Um, and it acts on the currency of the first object if we do this addition operation. Um, some magic methods will act on symbols like uh, square brackets. In this example, the D, uh, the dunder get item acts like a um, getting the dictionary key to from the dictionary D here. Um, or like in the example we saw before, the plus symbol. This example that I'm showing for dictionary works with a list too. And remember, dunder get item, we'll look at it a little bit later. And another interesting thing about magic methods is some of them map to built-in functions. So in this simple example here, dunder len maps to the built-in function len. So when I call the built-in len on my alphabet, it'll go back, call that dunder len method, and get the length of the string that I have represented there. Next, we have custom iterators. These can be really confusing at first. There is a lot of terminology, but if you remember these guidelines for how to make a class iterable, uh, it should be pretty straightforward. So first, in order to be iterable, a class needs to implement dunder iter. Next, dunder iter needs to return an iterator. Lastly, in order to be an iterator, a class needs to do two things. First, it needs to implement dunder next. And lastly, it must, uh, it must raise a stop iteration exception when there are no more items to return. If you follow that formula, then you're an iterator. So here's a scenario. Let's say I have a server instance, and it's running services on different ports. Some of those services are active, and some are inactive. And when we, wanna, when we loop over our server instance, we want to make sure that we only loop over active services. So here's our iterable server. We have defined a few different services running on different ports, like HTTP and SSH and FTP. And some of these are active, some are inactive. So in my uh, little example here, FTP is an inactive service. Now, um, I want to make this server iterable. And by do, by, uh, to, in order to do that, I'm going to set a start position when we first initialize it. And I'm going to implement dunder next. So as we're looping, dunder next is once going to get called by the next method. Um, here we have a little bit of logic to filter out what's active and what's inactive. And a little bit of optional Python 2 compatibility. At the bottom here, I'm aliasing next to dunder next. Uh, in Python 3, it's dunder next. In Python 2, it's just plain old next. A little bit confusing. Um, so by having this alias at the bottom, we can be compatible. Now, the piece that we're missing here is we've implemented dunder iter. And here, we're returning self. We can do that because we've done two things. We've implemented a dunder next, and our dunder next will throw a stop uh, stop iteration exception when it's exhausted. Uh, dunder iter is called when we first start iterating before ever calling next for the first time. And if we're looping over it like in a for loop or a comprehension, that in initialization will actually happen under the hood for us. Um, but if we need to, we can also get that iterator by hand by calling the iter built-in method. Now we can do something like this. We can just loop over our iterable server, get the protocol import in one step, and we don't have to worry about accidentally looping over an inactivated service. That's pretty cool. But here's a tip. If you don't really need to maintain a lot of state, you don't necessarily have to use an iterator. You can use a generator instead. Here we don't need that shim for Python 2.3 compatibility. Uh, Every, we only implement dunder iter, and we're looping over our services, and if that service is active, we're going to do something. Now, a generator doesn't care or know about its origins. It really only knows what the future holds. And we can do that with the yield keyword. <coughs> now, what is yield? A yield, in this case, is like a return, sort of. And we're going to cover it in more detail later. But what you need to know for now <coughs> excuse me, 
is that after yield, we still maintain state. So the next time we come back after a yield, we're just going to continue looping from where we left off. And this means we don't need to main state. maintain state like that current position. It, it's kind of done for us. Now, why does this work? Here we use the single parentheses to generate a generator comprehension. Technically, this is called a generator expression, but I like generator comprehension a little bit better. Um, so in this example here, we're returning a generator expression. Now remember that an iterator needs to implement Dunder next. In this case, uh, the generator has next implemented. Uh, so in my previous example here, I made a generator for range one, meaning it only has one item, zero. And we see that here at the top when we call next. If we try to call next on that generator again, we're going to get a stop iteration. So that generator fulfills um, everything that we need for an iterator. And that's pretty cool. It's a lot less code, and we don't really need to waste any resources on maintaining state. Next, we have a little bit of method magic that we can use. Uh, like I've shown you before, we can alias methods. And we can do that because those methods are just objects. They're just labels. Um, another cool uh, piece of method magic that you can use is called getAdder. For this example, I've defined a dog class. And that dog class implements a method called speak. Then if I wanted to use getAdder, this is a built-in. Uh, it takes three arguments. The first is an object. The second is the name of the method that you'd like to get. And the third is a default value, just like in a dictionary that you provide in case that uh, method isn't there. Now I can use getAdder on my dog instance that I created previously. And I can ask for the method speak. And what it returns here is a bounds method. Once I have that bound method, I can go ahead and call it. So I've got the speak method here by using getAdder on my dog and asking for the speak method. And then I can just use the, the parentheses syntax to call it. And it'll say bark bark. We can use this for something like a command line tool with dynamic commands. Uh, here, I've defined a class of operations. There are three of them. Um, I have say hi, say bye, and then a default operation that's going to get called if um, someone tries to call our, call our little command line tool with an argument that's not supported. Now, in my main method, I'm going to get the command and the argument from user input. Um, and then I'm going to call getAdder on my operations instance with the command that was specified, but also provide a default value in case the operation isn't supported. Lastly, I'm going to call that method with the argument that was provided. So if I run my little class, um, if I call the say hi method and pass in the value of Nina, then it'll go back and say hello Nina. If I try to put in some junk values, uh, it'll call the default and say that that operation is not supported. And this is kind of how the um, CMD module in Python works. And let's assume there's uh, some more error checking here. But I think uh, it's a pretty good small example to show you the power of getAdder. Lastly, we have partials. Uh, functool.partial. It's going to return a new partial object, which behaves like a function. It's called with arguments and uh, quarks. If any more arguments get passed in, they're going to be appended to args. And if any more keyword arguments are passed in, they're going to extend and override uh, the keyword arguments. A little bit confusing. Let me show you by example. Here, I'm importing partial from functools. And I'm creating a new partial function called base2. I do that by calling partial. I pass in int, which is the function that I want to call. And here I'm specifying base equals 2. So I'm specifying some keyword arguments. If I look at base2, 
the type of it is a functools.partial. I can now call that partial object uh, in this example with a binary number that represents 18. And that's the same exact thing as calling int, passing in that number, that binary number that I specified, and specifying a keyword argument of two. So that partial is kind of like an incomplete function. We haven't called it yet, but we could if we wanted to. Um, a library I really like uh, to use personally is called a GitHub, and it's a really badly named REST API client that has some uh, really, it has transparent syntax that allows for rapid prototyping of uh, any REST API. It's implemented in 400 lines of code. You can add support for any REST API in 30 lines of code. And a GitHub knows everything it needs to know about your protocol, like REST, HTTP, TCP, but it really assumes nothing about the upstream API. And just a little plug, this project is currently looking for a new maintainer. So if you're someone who would like to be involved in an open source project, this would be a really great way to get started. So how does this work? Uh, first, you define an endpoint URL and any other connection properties. Uh, here in my initializer, I am setting the uh, GitHub URL. And then we can start using the API. In my example, I'm providing a token, an authentication token. And then when I call uh, GH, which is my API.user.repos.get, what I'm actually doing is uh, writing a get request to the user slash repos endpoint. Notice here that it's up to you to spell things correctly. There's no validation on the URL at all. If this URL doesn't exist or anything else goes wrong, that the error that's thrown by the API is just gonna be returned. That's kind of black magic, right? It's pretty cool. So how does this work? Well, firstly, each call on that API class is gonna ferry that, uh, the call to the, an incomplete request. If the last call is not an HTTP method, what it returns is an incomplete request with an appended path. So as long as we are not providing an HTTP method, that path will just get longer and longer and longer. We build on it. Um, but if that last argument is an HTTP method, it's gonna go and fetch the corresponding method on the client and return a partial method. Uh, and then I th um, an interesting thing to notice here is that we have aliased get item to get adder. And if you remember, that allowed us to fetch an item from a dictionary by key. And we'll go into that a little bit later. But I think this is pretty cool. This library is really elegantly written. I use it all the time when I'm prototyping different, um, working with different REST APIs. Now, given a non-existent path, it just throws a 404. And because get item is alias to get adder, we can also provide uh, custom values, in this case, my GitHub username and a repository that I wanna fetch. And then I can uh, call that by using the keyword arguments. So it's really cool. Um, the source code is pretty small. If you wanna see how it works, I recommend checking it out. Next, context managers. Uh, when should you use one? If you need to perform an action before or after an operation, some common scenarios are things like closing a resource, uh, like a file or a network connection when you're done with it, or performing some cleanup before and after a function call. An example problem here is feature flags. Uh, what's a feature flag? Sometimes it's also called a feature toggle. It's the ability to turn a feature of your application on and off really easily. Uh, for example, A-B testing, uh, if you have a shopping web page and uh, you want to show 50% of your users one version of the shopping cart, 50% of your users another version, and then test and see which version results in more uh, conversion, you can use a feature flag for that. You can use it for rolling releases, like uh, when you want to slowly roll out a feature. For example, only turning on your feature for 5% of users and seeing how it affects performance, or maybe showing a beta version of your application to users who've opted into your beta testing program. Here is a little example class. Um, I only have one feature flag, it's called show beta. 
do I want to show the beta version of my homepage to users or not? Um, this flag is currently turned on, so it's true. And I have two methods, is on, is this feature flag on or not, and a toggle method that will let me toggle the feature flag between on and off. Now, I want to do something like this. I want to be able to temporarily turn on that feature flag when I'm testing. How can we accomplish that? We can use the magic methods enter and exit. Here, step by step in the initializer, I'm sorry, in the constructor, I'm, uh, I'm uh, holding on to the old value of that feature flag. So I want to know if it was on before or not. And before, uh, before calling my method, I'm going to toggle that feature flag to whatever setting was passed in. And after I exit that method, I'm going to switch it back to whatever the value was before. The better way of doing this is with a context manager decorator. That's going to allow you to define a factory function for with statements without the need to create a whole class or setting up separate enter or exit methods. So in this example, I am importing it from contextlib, and I'm using it as a decorator. And we see that yield keyword again. So I save the old value, I toggle the feature flag, and then I yield. Uh, and after the yield, I'm going to toggle again. I'm going to toggle that feature flag back to the old value that it was before we ever entered this context manager. So let's get back to yield for a second. What exactly is happening here? Yield is giving up control for the time being. You do what you need to do before the method is run. Then you're going to yield the control to the method you just called. Um, to, the, to the method that's uh, uh, wrapped with the context manager. Now, once that method completes its run, the yield is over, and we re-enter our context manager, so we can just run the code that we wanted to run on exit. With either implementation, we can do this. We can get the home page URL. Um, if the feature flag is on, we'll return beta. If the feature flag is off, we'll return the home page. And uh, for our tests, we can also use the with syntax here. Um, so with our feature flag on, we want to test that our get homepage URL method returns beta. When it's off, we want to make sure that it returns uh, the regular homepage. Now, decorators, uh, the simple explanation for them is that it's syntactic sugar that allows for modification of an underlying function. And a quick recap of them, uh, for those that aren't familiar, they wrap a function in another function, and then they can do something, either before the call, after the call, um, both with provided arguments, and they can even modify the return value or the arguments. And even if you are familiar with decorators uh, and regularly use them, I find that it's a topic that can be hard to understand, something that people are frequently confused about. So let's dive into a quick recap of how they work. Here's some example code that we might write if we didn't have access to decorators. So we have one method, hello, at the top that just prints uh, hello and the past in name. And we have a second method called say after. And what we want this method to do is given any type of greeting function, either the hello that we have on top or maybe a greeting in a different language, we want to print out that it was nice to meet you. So we have a say after function, and it takes an argument of a hello function. Inside that function, we take the argument of the original name that was passed in. So we call the original hello function, and then we print it was nice to meet you. And what the say after function returns is another function, an uncalled function in this case. So if I were to call hello Nina, it would print out hello Nina. If I were to call out say after and provide the argument of the function hello, and then call that with the argument Nina, it would uh, print out hello Nina, it was nice to meet you. So this is the kind of 
uh, this is what it would look like if we didn't have a decorator. Uh, but if we do have a decorator, we can just use this syntax. It's the same uh, two functions from before. I wrap, I add the at say after decorator to my hello function. And now when I call hello Nina, it'll print out hello and then go into the decorator and uh, print out it was nice to meet you. So in this case, the decorator just wraps a function. Um, and before I talk about decorators with arguments, which um, is kind of an extra layer of confusion, I want to give an example of a closure. In this case, you can think of this closure as a factory for multiplica uh, multi multiplication methods. Excuse me. Um, so I have a parent function multiply by, and then I have this inner nested function that actually does the multiplication. Uh, given a number, it'll return uh, the multiplication between that number and whatever argument was passed in to multiply by. And the value that it returns is a function. So I can make a function called multiply by 5 by passing the number 5 into multiply by. What multiply by 5 is, is a function. And then I can pass uh, number arguments to multiply by 5, like 4, and end up with the result 20. But I'm not limited here. I can uh, make this factory function for whatever numbers I'd like. So decorators that take arguments are kind of the same as the closures from the previous example. The outermost function becomes a factory. It's the same as calling this on an undecorated function. Um, so here I have a decorator that takes an argument. I want to say uh, it was good to meet you or it was bad to meet you or whatever. And I'm wrapping my hello function um, into the three layers of uh, arguments there. The problem with decorators is that you lose some context. Um, here I have a method that, uh, I'm sorry, a decorator that's called say by. If I use that decorator on a function called my name, if I try to get the name of that function after wrapping it with a decorator, it just, it's a wrapper. If I try to get the doc string of my name, even though I have a comment here that says say my name, it's going to be empty. The way that you can get around that is by using wraps or the wrapped library. Uh, in this example, I'm importing wraps from contextlib. And I'm wrapping the uh, inner function. That is, we're going to pass in uh, which function we want to wrap to the wraps decorator. And after I do that, I retain more context. I can um, ask for the name of the function that I decorated and get the right value back. And I can also ask for the doc string. And it'll return the right thing. Some common uses for decorators, uh, logging, timing, validation, rate limiting, mocking, patching. So context decorators are really cool. They're context managers and decorators combined. Um, as of Python 3.2, context decorators are in the standard library. And they're really the best of both worlds. By using a context decorator, you can easily write classes that can be used both as decorators with uh, the at symbol and context managers with the with statement. And context decorators is used by uh, the context manager. So you're going to get that functionality automatically. And let me show you a code example. Remember that context manager decorator from earlier? We imported it from contextlib for our feature flags. Um, we can also use it as a, we can use it as a context manager, but we can also use it as a decorator just for free. We don't have to do anything else. In the lower example, we'll see um, I'm adding a decorator of feature flag. Uh, the flag itself is show beta. On is false. So when I'm getting my profile page, we'll uh, return beta.html if the flag is on. Otherwise, we're just going to return all our plain old profile.html. A library that I really like that uh, lets your Python test travel through time is called freeze gun. 
we can use it as a context manager or as a decorator. What it does is um, freezes time in this example to 2012. I really recommend reading the source sometime. It's pretty mind-building. And uh, there's a section I'm going to skip. If you guys want to see it, you can look at my slides online. But in the meantime, I want to tell you that perfection is achieved not when there's nothing more to add, but when there's nothing left to take away. Lessons more, elegant code is poetic. And I've taught you some new tools today. I've taught you about magic methods that can make your objects behave like built-ins. I've taught you about some method magic, like aliasing, get adder, uh, partials, context managers, decorators, context decorators, and iterators and generators to loop over your objects and explain what yield means. So don't be a mindless code monkey. It's really easy to copy and paste code from Stack Overflow or try to stubbornly stick with the old paradigms of your old programming language. It's fine when you're working on personal projects or scripts, but it's really not a great idea when you're working on code that's going to be maintained by a team. So resist the urge. A deep dive into Python is going to open your mind to some new insights. And you can use these tools today to get started. But remember that with great power comes great responsibility. If you're using the same decorator in every function in your class, maybe you're not doing it right. Sometimes simplicity is better. But it's really up to you to choose the best tool for the job. And thanks.